And welcome, everybody, to another episode of Smart Money Circle. I'm your host, Adam Sarhan. With me today is a market wizard, a very special guest who can speak about the crossover between institutional and retail investing from a traditional equity and option standpoint, and also into the crypto world. His name is Tony Saliba. For those of you that do not know, he was featured in Jack Schrager's infamous or famous book, Market Wizards. And he's also the CEO of Mercury Digital Asset and Vice Chairman of Matrix Execution. Without further ado, Tony, welcome to the show. Adam, thank you. Such a pleasure to be with you. So, Tony, you have a remarkable story. I'd love to just begin by asking, can you tell us your journey and how you got to where you are today? <laughs> well, the, um, the, the professional side uh, was that I... Uh, really had an interest in um, journalism, actually. And my uh, counselor at, at the university, you know, told me this is 1973, said, you, you know, you're crazy, you know, uh, world's overrun with journalists. I said, well, I'm going to replace Harry Carey as announcer for the White Sox, which before the Cubs, he did the White Sox. And the guy actually laughed at me and said, that's one in a million. I said, okay, well then what should I, you know, who makes all the money? And they said, he said, well, you should go into business. And I'm like, okay. I mean, I had had uh, blacktop um, paving jobs and, and typical, uh, you know, selling uh, Christmas cards and cutting grass and shoveling snow and all sorts of things as a, as a kid. And I said, well, who, who makes all the money in business? And they said, we need accountants. There was a dearth of accountants in, um, in 1973, and they made about three times uh, entry level of journalists. So I got into business and then I really didn't like accounting. I got a, an accounting degree and, and I was decent at it, but um, it was kind of boring. So I took a job, uh, I was, I was uh, courted by like Procter and Gamble and uh, Deluxe Check Printing and a number of other uh, national names uh, as to do sales. And then um, somebody offered me a job in Indianapolis as a stockbroker, typical account rep um, right out of college. And um, they, they sent me the um, OCC's um, risk disclosure documents and said, I mean, I, I should get, I'll get you a copy. Um, they are nothing but legalese, right? And they sent them to me for my last month at school and said, um, uh, learn about options. I read this thing over and over and I had no idea. It was about exercise and settlement and, and um, uh, risks involved with options, but all from a clearing point of view. And I guess just today is I'm realizing why I don't like the clearing angle so much. <laughs> but um, I, so I was doing that. And then, you know, this was in the lazy, malaise days of uh, Jimmy Carter when I remember our biggest day. So I started, I started on the day that uh, Elvis Presley died in 1977. Okay. And uh, that was last a week ago um, was the anniversary. And uh, the biggest day we had in, in uh, the New York Stock Exchange was 11 million shares. Wow. I mean, typically we're doing seven, eight million shares a day and a blow off day was like 11 million. And we do that in, you know, first nanosecond uh, of the day. There's orders that big, right? <laughs> so, right. Right. Um, so I said, that I, I asked the, the old guys back, back then, Adam, you could, Smoke, they, they smoked in the, um, in the office. And as soon as uh, the market closed, these guys would light up stogies, put their feet up on their desks. And, uh, and I was like, who makes all the money in this business? And they go, the guys on the floor. And so I grew up um, caddying for a bunch of um, bean brokers uh, in this building, in the Board of Trade building right below me. And I said, really? Well, you know, I know some of those guys. So I, I um, circuitously made my way back to Chicago and became a, a clerk for a very short period of time. Um, I had gotten, uh, I took 
what little savings I had and paid the $1,500 to get um, uh, the CBOE test done and I passed it. So I had, maybe I showed, showed initiative. I didn't really think about that until just this moment, but I thought I had an added benefit of value to these uh, traders that were looking for clerks. And then one of the guys that I caddied for, uh, who back then, the CBOE had a, um, a, uh, a rogues gallery of membership, okay? Some of these guys had sold their business and just wanted a place to um, get away from the honeydew list. And some of these guys were um, gamblers at, you know, card counters and, and uh, wanted to use their skills at, at um, uh, mathematical, you know, uh, calculations and predictions. Then you had guys who kind of understood uh, the model. Uh, not a lot of people did. There were no computers. Obviously, we we could go we could go use a um, uh, a mainframe shared services where you know you put the phone in the coupler and um, uh, uh, type in on a heat sensitive Texas Instruments uh, keypad and it would print out your values. So. Um, so I was a clerk for a very short time. And then one of the guys that I caddied for who happened to have sold a uh, women's haberdashery business and he knew, he knew nothing about options. Um, and he walked around the floor, you know, with this uh, little, um, one of those uh, tipperillo, skinny black cigarillos, whatever, cigarette cigars, not lit, but you could smoke in the member's lounge upstairs and like dark, you know, not sunglasses, but um, uh, uh, glasses that would change, you know, and, and they were dark. And he said, you know what you're doing? And I said, uh, I do, I think, you know, I do. And I put on a spread for him and it um, did really well. And then uh, I ran over to him and I said, his name was Julian Good. And I said, Mr. Good, um, it's time to take the spread off. And he said, wow, you know, it was like five trading days, six trading days. And he had, we risked maybe $1,500 and made a couple grand. And he's like, can you do that again? And I said, yeah. And he goes, okay, what do you want to do? I said, um, get me on a seat. <laughs> so we became partners and um, I didn't do so. I, I really learned a lot about risk management, Adam. I I had a very uh, difficult first uh, month or so, and um, he gave me 50 grand and I almost ran through all of it. I, I had 15 grand left uh, on, I think it was Memorial Day weekend in May of 79. Uh, and I um, was thinking about rolling the dice and, you know, putting it on long or short and figuring that was it. But uh, I steeled myself and trimmed my position. I just was long a lot of premium, okay? And they took the air out of it and I learned a big, you know, important lesson. But um, so that's how I got started in options. And I would say my journey over the last, um, so that's, you know, what is that, uh, 40, uh, to 40, you know, 43 years ago. Um, and I started in this building. We had our office in this building. Uh, you know, for Liquid Point, we moved down the uh, street about two or three blocks and I was there for 21 years and I just moved in here in, um, in May of this year. But um, along the way, I would say each of the companies that I've launched uh, or products or solutions could go under the heading of necessity as the mother of invention. Right. And, um, and that, you know, I asked my son, I said, uh, okay, on my, you know, gravestone, you've got to put necessity was the mo mother of invention. And he said, uh, we're going to have a family crypt dad. So <laughs> that's awesome. I'll put it on the arch. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so along the way, I mean, I embraced technology in 1984. I was told um, 
So once I once I figured out trading, which was shortly after that near you know fatal uh, beginnings, um, I like everything else I do. I kind of traded to excess. I had a lot of, um, <clears throat> and I still do on my record on my CRD. And this is this is what's insane about the industry that. Um, uh, when I started, the position limits, and I don't talk about this very much. Uh, right. So, so this is you know not breaking news, but it's breaking in the fact that uh, these are my thoughts on this. Um, you know, 20 years ago there wasn't a FINRA. Each of the exchanges, you know, regulated uh, their members. You know, you had the SRO self-regulating organization, and then somebody had the great idea, you know, making it a, a profit center. And um, back in the day, 40 years ago, position limits on options were 500 lots per side. Okay, now there's reasons for position limits. I think they're super important in that um, the fear was somebody could just you know, buy a lot of options and um, um, not really move the stock uh, commensurately and take over GM. Okay? Right. Uh, so the limits were precariously low. They were made by, by people who build, you know, pilot programs. Right. Right. And, uh, the SEC always back then at least would err on the side of overly cautious being overly cautious. And, um, I heard this saying so often the pioneers get the arrows. You know, and I'm like, okay, but the position limit rules were not set up properly. I was trading really low risk, so I was spread all the time. And for your viewers who know what, what a box spread is, where I'm long a call vertical and long a put vertical or vice versa, um, you have four times as many options on is, is if you were just speculating and going long or short puts or calls. So by nature being risk averse, um, I was being penalized. So at the, you know, ripe old age of uh, 25, uh, I had a full-time legal team, which is kind of insane. And my lawyers said, uh, you know, because the fines were, were, horrendous you know they were right. progressive you know they started out like fifteen hundred dollars for the first one and then five grand and ten grand um so my lawyer said well are you making money doing this i'm like yeah but i'm being you know wrongly penalized for being safer in my trading so fast forward um we got a president uh, Chuck Henry, rest his soul. Uh, you know, I went to school in Indiana. Uh, he was from uh, down by Bloomington. I think he was from um, Columbus or, or around Bloom at Bloomington. And, you know, I was just this little peon trader, although I was one of the probably most active traders on the floor because I was always doing boxes and butterflies. And uh, one of the first people just that traded, embraced puts. Uh, so my lawyer and I put together a, um, a uh, presentation for uh, the president, um, Chuck, and, you know, he was kind of new, but I think I overwhelmed him with this list of things that would make the position limit situation uh, more tenable. And he said, you know, I'm going to look into this and I'll take your words to heart. And believe it or not, he took my ideas and we created a position limit committee. We had uh, exemptions. We had instant exemptions to handle a customer account. All the stuff that um, is part of the exchange process today, uh, 42 years later, um, you know, I still have... Uh, my notepad with my lawyer that I went and gave to Chuck um, because here's what I said and we'll end that 
this boring topic for a lot of people, but the, I said to Chuck, I'm a market maker. I'm standing in the crowd. And if I'm doing my job, I'm reacting to order flow. Right. I'm not a speculator. I'm not pushing the markets around. I'm not punting. I'm not long-term investing because it was cheaper to be on the floor and buy stocks than if you were, you know, using a broker. Mm -hmm. So I said, we should identify the flow and, and CBOE always held itself up as being the leader in technology. Okay. Uh, you know, there was four exchanges at the time, Amex, Philadelphia, CBOE, and the Pacific, right? And we always held ourselves up as the leader in technology. So I said, you're, you're databasing all the customer business. So plot it per strike. And if my transactions take the other side of, of customer business, then I should get a break on the position limits. So right. they, they injected all that stuff in there. And, but you know what? As recently as last week, right. onboarding with one of, our, one of Mercury's liquidity providers, a uh, big shop um, out of uh, Israel, and they, they came back and they said, um, Mr. Saliba, uh, he answered these questions because it looks like Mr. Saliba could be a compliance risk. Oh, no. <laughs> what were all these violations from the, the uh, 70s and 80s? Right, right. It still, it still doesn't go away. It harms me, Adam. It I just you. follows you around. That's so your Tony, yeah, yeah, let me just, let me break this down for the audience because you, um, you gave us a lot. So first off, you got started in the business because you wanted to make money. And you first, you want to be a journalist. You're like, yeah, not so much. And then you moved it to where the money is, follow the money got the OCC, which is the options clearinghouse, basically their legal ease, if you will. You dove into that and you kind of made sense of it. But from an application standpoint, trading standpoint, you had, were you drawn to options or where, how'd you end up going to the, uh, getting involved with options itself? And then I'll cover everything else you just said, but that's my yes. first question. Well, so the, um, so 78 options were, um, I'm sorry, 77 options were for, four years old and um, this regional brokerage, City Securities, um, uh, the guy running it, John Bittinger said, uh, hey, you know, we're, we wanna be young and innovative, learn about this new stuff, um, options. Gotcha. And, you know, once I got to the office, I, you know, cause I had, what I had done was uh, asked John if I could start in August because I wanted to get my last couple months at, at school without classes and everything, right? Yep. And um, once I got to the office, uh, the other brokers were like, uh, here, you know, there's some information about what options actually do rather than the legalese. I subscribed to... Uh, the Dow Theory letter. Gotcha. Subscribe to Joe Granville. I got a value line. There was only there was only four or five choices in '77 in terms of content. Yes. Yeah. You know, right. You're a great content provider. You know, I I was interviewed, uh, or I was on a, a a call with somebody who said uh, we're contenting now. Right. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. It, it turned the noun in, into a verb. But um, so I subscribed to everything, Adam, and started. I was literally religious about reading. You know, Granville was a perma bear. Uh, um, uh, the Dow Theory Letter. I forgot now who was writing it back then. But you know, he was um, re regularly bullish. Value Line was about you know investing in America and you know what you know, fundamentally what stocks look good. Um, I got some technical analysis and there was nothing on options. So, I, you know, I, so I started um, looking at, um, you know, there was no such thing as swing trading or, or uh, you know, uh, market, you know, day trading wasn't a, wasn't a word that we heard for another, uh, 20 years, but um, I, I was just, I had met a couple uh, guys who 
parents had accounts. And back then, um, the, the evening um, edition of the newspaper is where you got your closing quotes. Right. right? So right. Um, if you had an account at a brokerage, all the newbies had to stay and answer the phones. Right. So once the market closed, the phone started ringing and you were supposed to prospect by giving them quotes and, and, um, and, uh, schmoozing, of, <laughs> schmoozing, yeah. yeah, schmoozing, exactly, exactly. Yeah. right. And, so, um, you know, I talked yeah. about options all the time with these people. And now, Tony, talk, well, I'll, I'll unpack what you just said first, and I'm going to ask you a question about the actual strategy. So the position limit sizing, the reason why that was a problem, because on paper, it says you can't have more than X amount of contracts. But what Tony was doing, if I understand properly, was taking vertical calls and vertical puts. So you'd buy one call, but you'd sell at the same time, simultaneously at the same time, I, I, um, I think a call against it. So you, you're limiting the amount of downside that you can actually lose. But in order to do that, you have to have two contracts. So the actual risk would be, let's say one, and it's defined there, but the, in order, the limits, like the actual the number of contracts, it's twice to limit that risk. Is that a right. good way of explaining exactly. the box and the vertical well, and all that stuff? Yeah, exactly. So uh, like an actual example where if you're just buying calls, let's say um, it's a um, IBM um, 100, 110 call spread and you're just, or calls in the uh, hundreds were five in the tens were two. If you just bought the hundreds, you're risking $500 per contract. But by selling the 110, you reduce your risk to three by selling the 110 at $2. So that cut your risk almost in half. But like you said, Adam, you had two contracts they would count. Now, if you bought the opposite strike put spread, you bought the 110 puts and sold the 100, call, uh, 100 puts, you put on a box and that is an interest rate play, okay? But it's also a safe ground. If you're trading, you're, you don't go in to put on a box, but you work by market making and taking the order flow and end up with a safe position that has almost no risk. Right, but you that have a lot of contracts a, on, so that's where you got into problems with the limit yes. size. Okay. Yeah. And th yeah, that makes perfect sense. So um, let's talk about the strategy. You said you learned a really good lesson when you had went from 50 grand down to 15 with your partner. A, mm -hmm. what was that lesson? And then B, how did you develop the, strat the, the strategy? And if you will, what is it? And how does it evolve? All that fun stuff. Right. Well, so quickly on the problem that I had um, when I first started, uh, I, I bought a lot of premium. So I traded, I traded Teledyne. Back then also, another thing that, um, uh, you know, unless you're really a student of the market, we didn't always have indexes. You know, right. we, we, uh, we, we didn't have indexes until like 82 or 83. Uh, um, the CME brought out um, the S&P 500 futures. Um, so you had, I've actually had, I've had Leo Melamed on the show twice and he's the one who invented it and brought him out. So yeah, I was just going to say, I, you know, yeah. Leo, Leo and I go way back and when um, we, we did have indexes, we, we could calculate the Dow, we could calculate the S and P and other indexes, but they weren't tradable. Right. Okay? And, and when Leo Melamed took um, uh, the initiative to create financial futures, uh, it was a new, new day. Okay, yep. but, but this was four years before that. Okay, so what happened back then, and it didn't happen on the futures exchanges because they didn't have anything to trade, they had commodities. Right. But what happened when the market was going to move, they flooded proxy stocks. Okay. Gotcha. So there was IBM and Honeywell and Polaroid and Kodak and Teledyne mm -hmm. and Texas Instruments, and I could go on, but um, superior oil and Teledyne and superior, superior oil were extremely illiquid. Superior okay. oil was so illiquid, almost nobody wanted to touch it. I mean, gotcha. the equity, the stock prices were, um, you know, five dollars wide. You know, stock wow. maybe wow, like <laughs> three hundred to three hundred five. Okay, right now, 
I mean, if you look at Amazon today, you know, their markets are tighter, but, but we didn't have any technology and so on and so forth. But Teledyne was the next most volatile, but maybe at $120, the market would be 120 to 121. Yeah. Okay? Now, you know, when I'm, when I look at a, a hundred dollar stock today, like uh, Disney trades, you know, 116, 90, 94, 90, 92, 96. So it's four cents, but it's very, you know, it's, it's moving around. So Teledyne was, they didn't really rush in to buy superior oil when the market was going to move or sell it, but Teledyne they did. So I'm in Teledyne and back to your question, you know, what, what, did I, what was my lesson? I had bought a lot of premium at them because, you know, you could buy, uh, you know, $2 calls that could be $10, you know, within an hour or two. And in late March, so if you, you can do the research and you'll find that the most volatile months, they rank them for, you know, the VIX now, um, April was always, uh, October was the most volatile month and April was second. And I started right at the end of March. So my position, you know, was unrealistically inflated as they pumped up volatility. And then in May, uh, there wasn't enough liquidity for me to trade out of it. And the Friday before Labor Day, or Memorial Day, uh, they just, the market just took the air out of it and sellers came in and we collapsed uh, these prices. And, um, you know, I lost um, a good percentage, 30 or 40% of my account in one day. Wow. Uh, so the lesson I learned though, was to trade smaller, right? Right. I mean, people ask me all the time, you know, like, you know, what, you know, what do you recommend to new traders? And, you know, it sounds cliche, but no matter what your trading style is, whether you're fundamental or, or technical, whether you're short-term, mid-term, long-term, whatever, flipping or investing, money management is, is, is most important. You know, you can't over-trade your wallet. Your clip size needs to um, match your, your bank account and also your risk appetite. Some people have ice water in their veins and other people crumble immediately. Uh, none of us like to lose, but others can take losing a lot, a lot easier, a lot better. So my lesson was keep it trim, keep it tight. Um, so much so you can see that in all my businesses moving forward, I cre I've created risk management packages that met the way I traded. I traded in a very uh, unique way to a, a lot of people, uh, not, not saying um, others didn't uh, pick that up. Uh, I, I educated all my clerks. I, I you know, trained them and um, gave them a chance if they were any good to trade and back them. So, uh, you know, trading in a very uh, highly uh, spread position. There was an event in 83 where um, the CEO, chairman of um, Teledyne uh, used to always make bids for part of the, part of the stock. And these split uh, bids were really tricky because you didn't know where the stock was gonna trade right. after the uh, takeover or after the um, buyout happened. So um, I, um, there was an event in 83 where it surprised everybody on a really sleepy July morning. And he said, I'm going to, the stock was trading like at 130. And he said, I'm going to buy, uh, you know, 10% of the company at 180. Oh my God. So it blew out a lot of guys because right. stock screamed i think he said 150 to begin with and then he, he ended up walking it up yeah to, to well, well over 200 um fortunately my style of trading 
benefited me. And I passed out, I had these pens made at them and I passed them out and said, staying spread is staying alive. Nice. And, um, That's awesome. I love was, that. It was kind of in your face to some guys that were pounding on premium too much. Yeah. But uh, so I learned to stay spread and small. I love that. So let's talk about that from a practical standpoint for the audience. Would you say, uh, Tony, you're more of a fundamental in trader and technical trader? Do you combine both? Do you, uh, how do you, uh, what are you looking for for trades to put, are you looking for price anomalies, big draw, um, reversion to the mean or your trend follower? Like yes. How do you explain your well, strategy a little bit from a so, tactical standpoint? So, so I'm, I, I'm not a fundamental trader. I'm not, uh, I've never been really a, a, a technical trader, although I like that input. And I, one of the other things that I really recommend for uh, traders of all ages and of all experiences, and I'm sure those in your audience who have been doing this for a while, and this is one of the reasons why programs such as your cell of yours and others are so popular, and that is having a sounding board. Okay. Yep. You know, long before really powerful two yeah. decades before the internet, I, I, I was being told by people, wow, you, you know, you're, you're such a big trader and you still seek other people's opinions. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I would never dismiss anyone out of hand, but it was a data point. Right. And I would have an inner circle of friends and we would discuss their expertise. My expertise was predominantly volatility where how that was impacting spreads, things getting out of line, so to speak, right. right? Now, back then you didn't have these big combines like Citadel or, or um, Two Sigma or IMC or Simplex or Susquehanna, Wolverine making markets with, um, you know, Nanosecond. people, massive computer powers. A lot of it is mostly, um, it's, you know, uh, execution speed arbitrage, basically. Yeah, a lot of it. 100%. Okay? Yeah. You know, now I, I'm a market maker guy. I am all about giving the market makers as many advantages as they can because they are counted on heavily by the exchanges. We could, we could have a whole show on how great the U.S. options complex is compared to all the other ones around the world. I... I barnstormed around the world from 89 to 98, helping exchanges set up, uh, uh, helping equity exchanges set up options exchanges. Oh, wow. And, and um, to a man, not, nothing holds a candle to the liquidity of the US options market. It has everything to do with our very competitive and robust uh, market making structure, which Back in the day, there were hundreds of market making entities. Mm -hmm. Today, there are, you know, I, I can't even say dozens. There may be a dozen, okay, yeah. or less. And back then we had, you know, individuals and small companies and medium sized companies. And then CRT and O'Connor came around and then we had big companies. Yeah. So, so I would, back to the sounding board and the lessons, I would always um, seek out guys. You know, there were guys on the floor that never made trades, but they had these big um, notebooks. They were charting books and they would just stand there and they would chart all day long. And then maybe once a week or once a month, something would happen and they would walk into the crowd and load up on puts her calls, right? Right, right. So, you know, and I had relationships with those guys and I would, you know, one guy it, built across, I would say, you know, what's telling I looking like over here, you know, or whatever. And so, um, so you're essentially, you're, uh, getting out of line. You're, you're a market maker in essence, you look at prices, you look for anomalies, you look for uh, potential get, you know, move, big moves, volatility. And then you're looking to play, create structured options trades to minimize the risk if you're wrong and maximize the return if you're right. So in the famous Market Wizards interview, you had a butterfly spread on, I believe, for the 87 crash where you basically 
went long some puts. You had some other stuff going on too. But when the market collapsed, that's when you made a lot of money because you were positioned for those fat tails, if you will, or those big moves. Is that yes. is that a correct way of? Yes, that's, it. that's absolutely accurate. Now, I was on the floor. I was a market maker. My cost, I, I was paying more in commissions then than people trading today uh, at home pay. But you know, the whole race to zero on commission structure was, you know, hadn't really started yet. But but we probably you know, uh, had decent costs. The point is, it's hard to trade exactly that way from home. Plus I had order flow, okay. Yeah. But, but a lesson that can be taken from home is, and this is a super important lesson that I don't think a lot of people push. And that is, there's another way to look at the options pricing structure, okay? And um, you can look at theoretical values, which are super important, but then you need to really um, map your volatility and forecast volatility. Um, and depending upon what the what you know your audience is looking to do, everybody has their own goals. Um, there are spread relationships that point out that this is a better buy on the board than this one is because this spread is a little out of whack, okay? Now these big market making firms keep things in line much longer and much tighter than it ever used to be. But when, when the markets move, there are things that get out of line, but also legging into the spreads that I did um, become, uh, you can, you can put on a spread and forget about it until the, the stock makes the move that you want to and reduce your risk and then go back to it when you get the move and, and sort of play with it and take it off and make, um, take your profits or uh, add to it on top of it, lock in some profits and, and turn it into a, a more complex spread that can make more if the stock sits. There's a lot of different things you can do and really depending upon how much capital you have, um, it, it's worth looking into. Gotcha, well, we appreciate that. So Tony, how would you uh, handle, how do you handle risk in general from business or from trading? And what are some lessons you've learned with respect to risk management? I was, um, I was told early on that, that I was the guy on first that would, not take my hand off or my foot off first until my hand was on second when right. so so I'm always about trying to uh, another another nickname that a lot of people have called me is Mr. What if. So I constantly do what ifs and I always, you know, even in business, I I hate to say it sounds very trite. I've said it before, but when I was single, I had, I had girlfriends break up with me because they said, you never stop thinking. Because I would always, I would literally take my positions with me and constantly look at them and see if there was a better uh, uh, formulation. That was before we had software to do that. But even with software to do that and in business, because nobody's created a business risk management system because each business is different and and nothing standardized uh, to the degree that it is on um, an options, you know, listed options format. But I'm constantly um, looking at the angles. When I launched Matrix, yeah. um, we, you know, we look at our, our, um, our burn rate. We look at, you know, what's our worst case scenario. We put together um, pro formas that go out, you know, uh, three years. A lot of that is, you know, thumb in the air. You have, you know, make make some um, uh, dependencies on who can deliver. Uh, you have your people involved to a greater degree. Is that salesperson going to actually deliver what he or she says that she can? But it's always about doing what ifs, and always, even if you're just a stock trader, you know, you're like, okay. I mean, if you're in one stock, there's not a lot to do. But if you start to um, uh, put a portfolio together, then 
you know, are you looking at modern portfolio theory? What, you know, how are you actually looking at your exposure, you know, come, I hate to say it, you know, we would say, you know, shit house or castle, you know, right. what's, what's going to happen? And um, you can bleep that out. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, what is the worst case scenario? And I'm so uh, I'm very risk averse. I maybe have left money on the table when that's happened, but I've also been around to have uh, uh, a handful of really good paydays. And uh, I think it's better to, to have a defined risk and, and be able to do your money management where even if you know your worst case scenario happens, it isn't going to prevent you from staying in the game, coming back, you know, trade more. Yeah, I love that. So interesting. When you size your positions, Tony, and, and or I guess from a trading standpoint, do you look to risk no more than 1% of the portfolio, half a percent of the portfolio, a quarter, or do you risk more? And how do you, can you speak to that a little bit? Because I know that there's lots of different ways of, you know, well, so, risk. Well, you know, as a, when I was building big positions in market making, um, the, the risk was a lot bigger than that, you know, but yeah. then it also... You know, I was, I was looking, I would shock the position, you know, up 15 or 20 percent down the same, same with vol and just make sure I wasn't taken out when those happened. Okay. Right. So, um, you know, in 87, we had, uh, you know, here, here to four, that was the most you know, the biggest crash, you know, percentage wise, we had, um, I think it was a three plus uh, standard div move and options, you know, calls were rallying as the stocks were crashing, same way when stocks bounced, puts were still increasing in price because everybody was short volatility, short premium, and those who weren't were trying to uh, leapfrog those who were trying to cover. So you had insane situations where you had, um, I think, um, the OEX, which was the CBOE uh, index that kind of mirrored the S&P 500, you had uh, vols at like close to 300%. Right. Uh, you know, just unheard of. Um, so everybody... Um, has their own thresholds of where they want to do pricing, but you got to do a uh, worst case scenario, what ifs, and if you're um, long premium, you got decay to worry about too. I mean, what's been popular though over the last, um, you know, five or seven years with, uh, you know, QE is selling premium, okay? Yeah. Because the that was, guys, yeah. You know, the big guys would always come in and help you out, you know, right. even, even, you know, two and a half years ago when market hit the fan um, because of the lockdowns and COVID, you know, yeah. Start of the COVID scenario. Uh, I mean, you did get premiums on the moon for a very, very short period of time. I, I strapped them on and started trading a little bit for the first time because the vol the, the premiums were insane mm. and um, and then it snaps right back. So a lot of, um, you know, leaders have been telling their audiences, you know, uh, the short premium um, approach, because you do have time on your side, right? Until, um, yeah, until you blow up though. <laughs> you know, and, I, and, and I, yeah, you could blow up. And, yeah, right. <laughs> but if you're, you know, if you're sitting on, you know, if you're sitting on uh, a lot of capital and you're trading one lots, well, then, you know, you're, you're obviously not matching um, your trade size with your risk appetite, right. but, but um, doing your what ifs is really important. And I think, I think that, um, you know, I'm an options person through and through. I see everything, uh, even, even driving down the highway, I'm looking at lanes and you know gauging you know really long term here midterm which is a better lane to be in and, right um you know at the airport uh, 
you know, rush into gates, the same thing. So you look at everything sort of uh, with optionality and um, you should do your what ifs. I, I love it, Donnie. So I do the funny, it's funny. I do the same thing when I go through anything. Right. It's just how our brains are wired. Exactly. Um, you start to, your brain is wired that way. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Every, almost every decision is a trade for me. So it's like, okay, there's a risk and there's a reward. If I go here, what happens? What If I go there, what happens? And that's that. So I, I love that. Okay, um, Tony, I know we've covered a lot of ground. We are around the hour mark. So this happened to Leo, by the way, too, when he first came on. I invited him back on. I would like to invite you back on because we have so much more. We just barely scratched the surface. Uh, we've got crypto to talk about, Mercury, and, and just, I mean, so much more. Would that be something you're uh, open to? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, one, one thing before we go with that, I can say that we talked a lot about the early days and yeah. um some people live in the present, some people live in the past, some people are dreamers and, you know, only live, you know, and what could be, I, I early on learned, and I think a lot of this has to do with being an options trader and having, you know, uh, cycles, you know, back yeah. then it was quarterly and now it's, you know, daily, but you have these, you know, launches and then expirations and boom, boom, boom. So you have these cycles. So my brain has been trained to, you know, I, I constantly look back, reassess, try to challenge my memory. What was I doing back then? Um, you know, and I, I was a single guy for a long time. I took copious notes on everything. And, you know, one thing I can say about today, even though it's 14, 13 years old, Bitcoin that is, yeah. this industry and where we are today reminds me so much of 1977 the guys and gals who were on the floor in 1977 options floor they're like yeah we've been doing this for you know four years you know, yeah. crazy. and the rest of the world we hadn't really discovered it right right and crypto natives and people that have been in the business for the last five ten years in crypto given the nature of the launch and the nature of regulation and everything people are still just discovering it. And it has so much more um, uh, uses and wider applications than listed options, which I think are the best product that have ever been created. <laughs> um, seriously, yeah, I believe options you. on yeah. crypto, oh yeah. my God. So yeah, seriously. the way I feel today is like 77 on steroids. That's a great way to, to, to you know, so, you know, bring back the show from the very beginning to the end. So I, I love that. I still have a lot of questions I want to ask you, Tony, but I know from the interest of time, um, I do want to invite you back on to ask them. So I guess the final thing I would ask is what is the best piece of advice you'd like to share with your 30 year old self or 20 year old self or, you know, that you'd like to share with the audience? Wow. Yes. Um, well, doing um, what I've said recently is if you are a creator and I, cause a lot of people ask me about entrepreneurship and trading is entrepreneurial. Um, I would say having a posse or a trusted source to be a sounding board, okay? And if you're creating intellectual property, I mean, back then I knew nothing about intellectual property and I, I gave away a lot of my ideas. And yeah. um, uh, so, but more, basically for trading is to find mentorship. Um, you know, you're doing that work for them too, by bringing on guys like Leo and myself and others who, you know, have a lot of mileage. And, you know, I don't know how much Leo actually really traded, but he was a inventor and a creator. Um, but trading is that. So you need a a mentor sounding board group. That's why some of these, you know, chat rooms are um, very popular, but you also got to be careful because there's a lot of trolls in them too. So, finding, yeah, no, uh, you know, finding a sounding board. I love that. So actually Jim Ropel, the guy who introduced us and thank you, Jim, for the introduction. Um, I had him on the show a few years ago and it was the same concept where right away I saw the, uh, saw it. I'm like, this guy's got a tremendous amount of knowledge, expertise, wisdom, or in your words, mileage um, that he can share with the audience. Then we set up growthstockmentor.com and that's, you know, just taking on a life of its own. So, um, and we can, anyway, thank you, Tony. Well, I, I, things I, that you guys see, things that you see, Adam, and that Jim sees and I see that are very obvious. 
that if somebody is in their early stages, you know, one, one last thing, we used to say, we had a training program uh, to teach people options. We used to say, uh, when a better trader picks your pocket in the crowd, they don't tap you on the shoulder and explain why. I love that. <laughs> so, so, you know, finding programs, listening to others, sounding board, you, you can do a lot for uh, very little or even free these days. Uh, so yeah, find a mentor. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, Tony, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, what's the best way, your website for Mercury, so people can, can follow up and then we'll have you on separately to dive into crypto and Mercury, if that's okay with you. But Right. Well, we have a utility token that we just launched um, overseas and we'll be bringing it to the US shortly. But if you go to um, Mercury Digital Assets, all one word, Mercury, like the planet, like the, the god of messages, uh, like the space program, all wrapped into one, um, mercurydigitalassets.com. Um, we will have um, very soon this week launching a chat to talk about our uh, token and crypto. So, but also um, I answer all my emails. So if you hit me there, I'll, I'll respond to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you kindly, Tony. This has been awesome. I hope we'll have you Thanks, on again Adam. soon. Thank you very much. Look forward to it next time. Yep.